All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us again on the Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast. I am Jesse Collings, as joined as always with Jason Unpresser. Jason, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well. You know, it's uh, pretty shocking that uh, September is coming up pretty soon. It seems like the year flew by. Yeah, I feel like that's been the entire pandemic is time goes by both very quickly and very slowly. Um, we were off, we, we, I was on vacation. I think Jason, you were on vacation as well. Uh, that was before, I, I think we just, I think we just overlapped back and forth on vacations. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, I am back. I got a absolutely horrible sunburn. Um, everyone wears sunblock. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm just, I got it on Saturday and I'm just now like <laughs> entering the full recovery phase of it. Um, but we're not here to talk about sunburns. We're talk here to talk about NXT, NXT, NXT. And I feel like we've talked a lot about NXT on this show, um, more than I would have probably originally envisioned. Like NXT would be such a recurring topic. But really, NXT, when it comes to WWE, is probably the most interesting brand as far as just stuff happening and backstage stuff happening, in the ring stuff happening. Uh, it's, it's to me, the most, in a lot of ways, the most interesting thing to follow within WWE, especially like kind of what we're doing, which is kind of looking at the big picture of things. And we got a big picture story today about the revamping of NXT, Jason. Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, just not only just for the past, Past couple of weeks, even just this morning, uh, from the Wrestling Observer newsletter, you know, just the whole, uh, I guess, edict, I guess you can call it, of like no indie wrestlers. Uh, but even like before then, you know, just a whole overall change that um, uh, we're probably going to see uh, sometime soon. Yeah, and and they're serious about this. This isn't like a rumor because that's kind of how it originally started, which is like they're going to overhaul NXT. And I'm like, okay, like what what does that actually mean? Like overhaul NXT? Is that just they're going to book some things a little differently? But then, you know, you have Nick Khan going on the, the, the podcast with Ariel Hawani, and he's straight up saying, like, we're going to revamp NXT. It's going to be completely different. Like, and so they're really serious about this. This is one of the most significant, like, proactive moves I can recall WWE making in that regard is that they are really serious about um, doing, doing this and revamping NXT and changing NXT what is your kind of original kind of reaction to, to, we don't really know what it's going to look like, but what is kind of your reaction to just, you know, NXT ending as we know it, and then presumably being reborn in a new direction? Yeah, it was uh, pretty shocking because obviously you had uh, the Wednesday night war before this and obviously NXT, um, you know, they wanted to establish themselves as a third brand, even the wrestlers themselves, Johnny Gargano, I think is sort of the face of that, of the person that says, we're not developmental, we're, you know, we're our own brand, but, mm-hmm. you know, I think um, even the whole lexicon, you know, everyone still calls it a call up anytime someone from NXT moves to Raw or SmackDown. So, yeah, and so a, the I think leagues. after, I, yeah, exactly. But I, after I heard it, like it seemed to be inevitable that it would come to this. But at the same time, it was, it was kind of shocking because it did seem like, uh, you know, Triple H, Paul Levesque, you know, it seemed like he did have some sort of sway in the company. But I think even as you jokingly wrote in your like headline for an article, you know, uh, Triple, uh, Vince McMahon has a new son now. Yeah, it's definitely the most shocking element of this seems to be Triple H losing a lot of control and authority within WWE. I thought when Karrion Cross got called up and lost that match to Jeff Hardy, I thought that was very indicative of Triple H's, like Triple H cannot protect you on the main roster at all because you would think that he'd be like, hey guys, don't beat my un- my super protected unbeaten champion. You know, don't job him up to Jeff Hardy. And I thought that that kind of showed that, you know, Triple H's influence, ability to influence careers in WWE feels like it's um, almost at an all-time low, even going back to like, you know, the 90s when he was just breaking into the company. Uh, he really, it does seem like he has lost some control in NXT now. In that same interview, Nick Khan was very adamant, you know, it's going to be Triple H, he's the main guy down there, but we're also clearly seeing some level of, of Vince taking a, a more hands-on approach to the product. There was the trip a month ago where Vince famously went to the performance center and he looked at everyone and everyone was worried that they're, they're going to get fired or 
Um, and, but clearly when he went down there, he wasn't impressed with what he saw and he wants to, to revamp the, the entire program. And one of the things when we discuss NXT is I do think that there is a lot of confusion about NXT, the television show, and NXT, the company, the, 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 the brand that produces takeovers, you know, what we see, and the NXT as, you know, the WWE Performance Center, as, as a place where people train to become better wrestlers. NXT, the television show, is not developmental for the most part. It's talent from the indies or New Japan or Impact or don't, who don't need to develop any further. And the performance center is a lot of, you know, these ex-college football players and bodybuilders and fitness models and whatever training to become pro wrestlers. And I think that a lot of times people are like almost really confused when they talk about it because they say, well, NXT is not developmental. And I think the TV show, you're right. But the performance center and the guys doing going in, into hip, clop, hip, hip toss class and guys doing promo classes, that's clearly developmental. And I don't think the brand has, kind of, I think it's really kind of created a lot of confusion, both internally and externally, about what is actually happening in Orlando and what are actually the goals in Orlando. And I think part of this whole thing, like you said, the no more indie talents, we're not signing any more indie talents, which is basically, we're not signing any more experienced talents. I think the idea is we're going to do this the show is going to be true developmental. We're going to have greener talent. We're going to have self our, our own trained talent on the show. We're not going to be having, you know, someone with 15 years experience up and down the card um, and kind of reset. Like this NXT is developmental. It's not a third brand. Shut up, Johnny Gargano. Shut up, Adam Cole. Like this is, this is what it is. It's, it's for, it's OVW, it's Florida championship wrestling. It's what had previously been kind of existed as here are a bunch of big green guys and, and women, and they're going to learn on the fly, as opposed to what kind of NXT has been, which is kind of like, this is WWE's version of independent wrestling. Yeah, for sure. I mean, at the same time, you know, I think, I think, um, I think I, I've seen from some people like how, Oh, um, you know, like, like sort of W is looking to, to sort of like the whole, like the doing it the right way kind of thing. Like, you know, not everyone needs to go to the indie route and then to WWE. Like, I, I think just to sort of move away from placing blame on all these athletes and all the uh, performance center people, because like, you know, obviously there's different paths to wrestling. And so you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with you know tr trying to get a football player or like a weight weightlifter or fitness model and training them to be a pro wrestler but at the same time i think just the whole like the whole contrast of what we've seen these past couple of years and just sort of going to a whole 180 i think that's the big thing that people are more focusing on and i think that's where you know the big focus is it's just that oh we built the super indie for the past couple of years but now we're just going back to uh developing these football players or these you know these weightlifters which you know, on the face of it in a vacuum is not really a bad thing because you know obviously there's no uh, specific way to become a pro wrestler everyone has their different paths you know that everyone in the history of pro wrestling has different um you know journeys to become a pro wrestler and so i don't think anything's anything's wrong with that specifically but i think it's just more of the whole 180 of a super indie to like you said an ovw or fcw type Right. And look, I think people need to look at the big picture here, which is the reason Vince McMahon is mad about is doing this is because he feels like on the main roster, he doesn't have that next generation of great superstars. He looks at the talent he has and he says, I don't have the next rock. I don't have the next Steve Austin. Why don't I have that? And the, the blame is being put on NXT for not producing that kind of talent. And it's easy for people to look at Adam Cole and Johnny Gargano, for example, who are physically not Vince guys and say, well, NXT is pushing all these small guys. Vince wants big guys. That's why they're doing this. But really to me, the problem here is Vince feels like he doesn't have his next generation superstars because Vince McMahon is bad at his job, which is, you know, creative in WWE booking, right? NXT, you can look throughout the history of NXT. It's been well-documented. Talent gets over in NXT, they come up to the main roster, and Vince drops the ball with them. In, in the, you know, in a variety of different ways. There are people like, you know, um, 
I'm going to use this example a lot, like Donovan Dijak immediately, right? He's dead. Like he gets renamed T-Bar, he gets put in retribution and he's dead immediately. And then you have other people like Kevin Owens who do get big pushes, but over time, because WWE of 50-50 booking and a lot of senseless heel and babyface turns and a lot of times making talent look like geeks, uh, you know, they kind of end up being just kind of fungible mid-card talent as opposed to Steve Austin or The Rock. And to me, that's all entirely on Vince. And so I don't know, like if we're going to change NXT and it's going to be football players and it's going to be big, big guys with big muscles and, and women with big implants or whatever, you know, Vince and John Moore and I just want, that's not going to change Vince's booking philosophies, right? Because we seem to have this idea of a Vince guy, right? Vince likes big guys. Vince likes guys with big muscles. And NXT needs to give Vince those guys because he won't screw those people up, right? He hates Ricochet because Ricochet is small. So he screwed Ricochet up. But you look at his track record, he's very impartial when it comes to butchering people once they get to the main roster. Like, again, Dijak, look at Donovan Dijak. That's a Vince guy. Look at him. You know, he's six foot six. He's a former football player. He's got a good body. He's got, he's got a good look. He can, he's a really athletic. That's the kind of guy Vince would want. He checks all the Vince boxes immediately just buried six feet into the ground. Like as soon as he gets on the main roster, carrying across checks a lot of the, you know, the boxes that Vince would like immediately losing to Jeff Hardy, 50, 50 booking. He's given a terrible costume again, just immediately bl bl blows it. So I don't see like ultimately the big, from the big picture's perspective, I don't think changing NXT is going to solve WWE's problem. It's just going to change who they push. And I don't think the talent being six inches taller in a few years than they are today is going to like change anything on the main roster. The problem remains Vince's execution and Vince's inability to create characters and storylines that get people invested in the product. And that's not going to change if the talent's bigger. It's just going to be, you know, bigger, probably worse overall talent that is being treated like that instead of, you know, Ricochet or Adam Cole. Yeah, 100%. I mean, you even look like a, a guy like AJ Styles, you know, he's, you know, not really the biggest guy in the world, but, you know, clearly Vince, you know, ha has some sort of affinity towards him. Uh, that's why, you know, he really likes to make him a solo guy rather than pairing up with the, the good brothers before, you know, he is always relied upon in whatever in moments. And so, you know, it's obvious that Vince is kind of just, um, like fickle, you know, pretty much in terms of who he wants to push, you know, there's really no specific thing. Uh, like you said, like, you know, the various got very, very big guys have come across WWE, but you know, at, at a moment's notice, you know, they could be wearing a dumb costume uh, on raw the, the, the next night. And so, yeah, like, you know, it doesn't really matter what happens in developmental because yeah, at the top Vince McMahon um, is going to do whatever he wants. You know, I think, in the earlier report, it just it um was noted that like John Lord Nidus and Bruce Pritchard are the guys in Vince's ear right now. Uh it could obviously change any time. You know, someone else could have Vince's ear. Maybe Shawn Michaels uh has you know catches Vince on a good day and you know Vince would just change his mind about whatever he wants. You know, it you just this is the kind of person you're dealing with up top. And so yeah, um I think it's just more gonna affect, you know everyone else at the bottom with NXT and like whoever uh, has, uh, we we're seeing it right now, you have guys like Bronson Reed get um, cuts, even though they had a pretty dominant run in NXT and, you know, other guys like, you know, Tyler Rust, you know, Alex Zane, you know, those guys who are just, you know, pretty, pretty new to the company already getting cuts. And so that's really going to affect those guys at the bottom and not really anyone at the top. Yeah. I mean, I don't like seeing people get cut. Obviously it sucks to lose your job, especially people who have, you know, yeah. uprooted their lives to move to Florida. At the same time, WWE did go through a phase where they, they were hoarding talent. They were signing everyone they could get their hands on. Anyone that showed any form of promise on the Indies was popping up at NXT. And, uh, you know, I think that maybe wasn't the best practice. I think they had a lot of they just didn't have enough time to, to, to give to all these talents. So they were just kind of hoarding them. And, you know, it's fine to let them go. It's healthy for the business. I mean, it's, like I said, too bad for those guys, but it's healthy for the business that people like Alex Zane and Bronson Reed are back on the free agent market and whatever they're doing, whether they, um, you know, go work various indies, whether they go to Ring of Honor or some of them might go to AEW or Impact or whatever. It's good to have the talent more spread out than they're just 
all being in NXT and never making NXT television. But at the same time, I do think that the transition that we are going to see, I'm very interested in seeing the transition of NXT, like the television show, because the idea is we're going to be getting away from the Johnny Gargano, Adam Cole types. And Cole, you know, pretty sure is on his way out already. Um, I guess there was a rumor that Gargano was going to be booked as the top heel in NXT, which is interesting. Um, some guys will stick around. Like I'm sure Gargano will stick around or Champa might stick around. But, uh, you know, your Jake Atlas types are already being released. And I wonder... Like when is, how are, how is that transition going to take place? Are we just going to start seeing a bunch of, you know, green WWE Performance Center trained people that all have the, the WWE Performance Center approved name or the, the, the NXT name generator. And they're just going to be on NXT and they're going to be, we're going to introduce all these new characters and we're going to introduce all these new people. And the, the show is going to completely change brands. I find it to be really interesting to see like the actual transition of NXT from like super indie to, you know, this, you know, OVW. Yeah. Especially from a, uh, for uh, their network as well uh, for USA network. Like I'm sure um, I think there was a report like that, like USA, like, like we didn't pay for uh, basically a developmental brand, mm -hmm. you know, they want something out of NXT. You know, I think despite like the numbers showing that like, you know, the value of their media rights deal isn't really as high as uh, many others uh, uh, on wrestling, even to to port compared to AEWs, but still like USA still has some sort of expectations for NXT. And so, yeah, that's going to be curious to watch as well, whether, um, because I would assume like the ratings probably may, might take a slight dip if in terms of uh because yeah we're probably not getting a quality product if you're putting out these very green wrestlers out there and you're probably not putting out great matches and so i doubt you know there's a draw there and so i'm very curious to see how the network uh responds and whether that will cause some more changes uh coming up yeah i mean we definitely saw kind of a we've talked about it a lot on this podcast uh, a shift in NXT from when they were on the network to when they were on USA and that a lot of talent that would have been called up previously was sticking around because they had to have some draws down there to get people to watch NXT. And, you know, they, they put Charlotte down there. They did the whole invasion angle around Survivor Series where they had, you know, Seth Rollins and Becky Lynch and whoever popping up on NXT. We saw them like, look, NXT now has to be a company or, or show that has draws ratings that we have we were given away our big matches on television which never happened before we're having you know these special named events because they were a television show that was going to be evaluated against the rest of cable and, and against aew so they want really wanted to to make it like a must-see kind of event and now you're going in the complete opposite direction uh in, in some ways by doing that so that will be interesting and look just the nxt has been able to uh, become a reasonably popular entity in wrestling. They, you know, the show maybe doesn't do as well as they wanted to on USA. It didn't, didn't do better than, than Dynamite, but is competitive, you know, compared to the rest of the cable. And the, the takeovers, you know, were drew, drew, used to, I guess, when they still were allowed to, to run arenas, were drawing big crowds. Um, they had successful touring brands. It was popular you know, as the super indie that WWE was running. And now you're going in just the complete opposite direction where you're going from, this is where, you know, the best wrestling, the best in-ring action is happening to perhaps this is where all these people who have barely wrestled are going to, you know, cut their teeth. And, you know, there's going to be a lot of sloppiness. There's going to be a lot of, you know, simple style wrestling. And there's not going to be a lot of flair because these people are just learning. And that's a completely different, identity for the brand and I feel like a lot of people that are big fans of NXT now are going to be like what the hell is this why are we seeing you know it's a completely different change for the identity of the brand and I don't know what fan support is going to be like for that yeah, I mean uh, essentially NXT has become the G League for um, WWE compared to the NBA yeah. And even then, like like the G League, it is pretty much mostly on Twitch. It you know does okay numbers, but no one's really talking about the G League except for you know college basketball nerds because now they have like a whole like a select team for like you know college basketball players who don't want to go to college. And so 
um, that's really the only draw. And so I guess maybe um, that's why you hear in this type or the Gable Stevesons, the, um, the Brock Lesnar lookalike or whatever, Bro- uh, Bronson Richtensteiner, you know, you hear hype for these cool. guys because like, I'm, hey, you I'm need something to watch, you know, some type of draws. I'm very excited about Bronson Richtensteiner. I wish, I wish Bronson, let's just call him Bronson Steiner because that's what he's going to go by in real life. He's Rick Steiner's son, yeah. for people who don't know. Yes. I wish he was trained by anybody else than WWE because that's an element of this that comes. So, so um, uh, that's the element that comes into this, right? Which is the track record of the pure performance center trained people, which is who WWE is presumably going to be putting on this NXT show, right? We're getting rid of the indie guys. We're going to go with our own guys. Like it's people seem to think that they're getting rid of all the indie guys and then they're going to sign all these big football players and it's going to be this whole new era. But WWE has been signing these new football players like all of the time, constantly. They just rarely make it to w- to NXT television because they don't fit the mold of what NXT TV is supposed to be. And maybe that is the ultimate goal here is to get those people on television so they're getting TV reps as opposed to just doing nothing because, um, you know, NXT has a where i guess what it used to be as opposed to what it's going to be has a really high standard for like how good you have to be to to justify you know being on the card and you know we saw it over time with people like lars sullivan um in in baron corbin which would be a, a good example of like talent that like the nxt fans didn't really like because they were clearly not up to the same in-ring standard as your you know your uh Finn Balor's and your your Sami Zayn's and your uh, Adrian Neville's and those kind of talents, um, and so perhaps by getting rid of the indie guys, you lower the standard so people are more accepting of those big football players getting TV reps. But the track record of WWE perf- like pure performance center trained talent is really like, poor. They have tons of they have like a, over a hundred people right now in the performance center who aren't on NXT TV who are, you know, these big, strong athletes that Vince presumably loves, who have never been good enough to get on television. And I think there's a lot of questions about how effective the Performance Center for all of its polish, for all of its, the money that's been invested in it, how effective the Performance Center actually has been at getting these people who are good athletes up to a national TV standard of skill level, because the successes are few and far between. Baron Corbin is like a top 1% outcome of that. Like to get as good as Baron Corbin is now is like, that is like one out of every 100 talent they've signed are going to hit that level. At least on the men's side, there's a little more success on the female side, but it's, it's a really interesting uh, part of this is that the current system in in the performance center doesn't appear to be very good at training wrestlers. Yeah, for sure. I mean, even like um, it's, it's, very muddled as well because in their PR spin, you know, they named guys like Shinsuke Nakamura as a performance center uh, success, which obviously he's not. And so that's pretty tough as well, you know, getting up uh, all that PR model. But yeah, you're right. Uh, very few in between uh, for these uh, performance center people to actually maintain success, you know, unlike, you know, other sports, like I mentioned, the G League, like the G League has actually produced. Um, you know, some actual NBA talents, you know, well, not, not, not uh, very few stars. I mean, Chris Middleton um, is probably one of the biggest stars for coming out of the developmental uh, system for the, the whole G League system there. Uh, but even other than that, you know, have a, a ton of role players that have got decent roles in NBA teams. And so that's unlike WWE, where they can't really have that, they don't really have that success just yet. And like, yeah, like you said, it's a big test for guys like uh, Triple H and Shawn Michaels to really uh, prove how well they are as coaches. Uh, to really coach up these guys, and even like the Norman Smileys, you know, the Matt Blooms, even to other people on those lower ends as well. Yeah, well, you can go back to like previous incarnations of de- WWE developmental, and you can see more success. Um, OVW is a good example, right? So, uh, OVW, which was the WWE developmental from like, I don't know, roughly like 1999 to 2007, let's 2008, let's, let's yeah. use that, right? In like a very short period of time, OVW, again, mostly from scratch here, you know, they produced John Cena, they produced Randy Orton, they produced Brock Lesnar, they produced Dave Batista, 
Now those are top guys, right? Those are your top, top guys. And that was like in like a two year window, they did that in OBW. And so whatever it was, whether it was, you know, Jim Cornette was down there. I think it was, um, it wasn't Les Thatcher. I'm trying to think who the guy was. Someone's killing me. Maybe Rick Rogers, whoever it was. Um, that just were better at taking green guys with potential and turning them into very good professional wrestlers. And that was in, a, in that, that, those are just the top guys. You can look below, uh, at a, like a notch below the, you know, Bobby Lashley, Shelton Benjamin, John Morrison, like just a way better track record of taking again, like good athletes and turning them into pro wrestlers basically. Um, and the performance center just doesn't have that. And is that because, the performance center, you know, these, these hip drop, hip top classes, hip, I can't say hip uh, toss for some reason, hip toss classes, <laughs> whether it's uh, the promo classes, whether all this stuff isn't working or, you know, like we said, Vince McMahon isn't pushing them the same way he pushed like Batista and John Cena and Brock Lesnar. And so that's why we don't have them. But to me, I think there's a lot of questions to be asked about how effective the performance center really is a training talent. Um, and like, you know, like you said, like, I don't even consider it like the G League, right? Because the G League is kind of like, if you're really good, you don't go to the G League. If you're like drafted out of, you sure. know, college, you just go right to the NBA. Um, the G League is kind of like a stop for people who have like, who ha- are, are have really raw skills they're looking to refine. I mean, this is, this is more than that. This is like having a minor league baseball system that just never produces major league talent. Yeah. Right. Like the, the Red Sox have not famously, the Red Sox have not had a really successful starting pitcher that they developed entirely on their own since Clay Buckholtz, which was like 15 years ago. And that's been a big question is like, how come we can't produce our own pitching? And it's hampered the Red Sox as a team over the years. Um, that to me, this is that to me with the performance center, it's more like that question. It's like, what are we doing wrong in the performance center? We have all of these incredible athletes that are coming in and they're not getting better. And you can see with some people like Tay Conti is being a good example, right? She was in the WWE developmental for a few years. She was a really good national athlete, basically did not show any signs of real improvement over a few years. And then she went to AEW. She started being trained in a different environment with, you know, Dustin Rhodes and all that. And immediately showed some signs of improvement. We're like, hmm, you know, is, 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 so she clearly was better off outside of WWE developmental than she was in it. And how many talent do we see that are like that? And what is going to happen if we just get rid of all of the talented indie guys? And now all we have for the most part are these green football players and these green fitness models. And is that going to actually, are we actually going to produce the kind of talent that we expect we will because we're we're signing all these good talents? Yeah, it's definitely just a wait and see for now. Um, Yeah, even just, yeah, I think, I think you're right. Like using the baseball development uh, minor league system example, or even soccer, you know, uh, the uh, uh, developmental academies, you know, obviously like, you know, the big part of being a soccer fan, especially for a club team is, you know, looking forward to these young academy players uh, getting their starts on the first team. And that's something you're not not really see much in NXT, you know, it's usually just uh, the same crop of people, you know, your Johnny Gargano's, your, uh, uh adam coles and even on the the women's division as well um we're, i mean to, to lesser extents uh for there but uh you know we, we just it's more of just a way and see of whether they can actually produce these kind of talents into uh the quality at least they they want at, uh for for their television yeah i mean on the men's side if you look at the wwe main roster and you look at the men's side of who was actually trained from scratch by the WWE Performance Center. It's not really that many guys, given that you would think that it should be mostly that talent. And it's not like a lot of people who are pushed very heavily. Like I'm just thinking off the top of my head, like on the men's side, you have Corbin, you have the Street Profits, um, You know, you had Strowman, who was probably your biggest success, who they released. Yep. Um, you know, Strowman, that, which is another weird thing, because Strowman is the kind of guy that Performance Center recruited, obviously had the look that Vince craved, you know, kind of a quickly went, put him through the developmental system, never even went on NXT TV, got called up, learned basically everything he needed to do on the main roster. Um, and it got released, even though he was exactly kind of what you want. 
Um, I'm trying to think who else in the main roster. Street Profits, both guys in Street Profits, Corbin. I mean, there has to be more. Um, all, almost. That would be one. Um, right. I'm trying to think because you have people like Roman Reigns who are WWE trained, but they're kind of pre exist. You know, he's an FCW guy. He's not, he wasn't at the performance center. He wasn't do, in hip toss class. Um, I'm trying to think, like, I don't think, I don't think there's that many more. So that kind of tells you uh, how successful the performance center has been is they're not getting guys who are good enough to be on WWE television. And even if they are, it's not always in like a top role, which I think is what the idea is that we're supposed to have the next Steve Austin and the next Rock. And instead, we're getting, you know, people who either aren't good enough to make television or people who have kind of a limited ceiling. Yeah. It seems like a lot of paper numbers guys as well. You know, I, you know, you hear a lot of stories from people who were at the performance center and they leave. And I think a big common thing is the promo classes. I think a lot of, uh, you hear a lot of stories about people in promo class, how like, oh, I decided to do something different. I wanted to be more unique in my story and doing promo class instead of just doing the, oh, just introduce myself and all that. And that's a common story you hear from a lot of people who left the performance center. I remember um, Matt Lee and uh, Jeff Parker from 2.0 uh, ever, formerly Everrise. You know, they, they told that similar story as well. Like they got to do their promo together in promo class or at least in their tryout uh, for their promo, and they got to do something unique, you know, they saying like Little Mermaid um, for whatever, and that's what helped them stand out uh, to get hired. And that seems like a common thing. And so it's really making a question of like whether how useful uh, all these classes are, like, you know, like I said, the hip toss classes, or even like the arm drags and doing all these uh, back bumps and even the promo classes themselves, like how useful are these things if you know a common thread in these stories from people who leave the performance center is just oh oh i just did, i just went against the grain i did something different i want to be more unique yeah and like i said there's a lot of questions in that can be asked about like how effective all this stuff is and the promo class i mean WWE promos in general are just you know that's a huge problem for them as a company, like as far as just even on the, on the main roster, people who are good talkers being scripted, people making, you know, they have to say stupid things. They have to, you know, make bad jokes or whatever is going on. Um, I'm looking at the, the, the raw roster right now. So at a purely trained WWE guys, I'm looking at, um, I see, uh, I forgot about Reginald and I forgot about, oh, okay. Um, but I think so. It's a, I think on Raw, it's just Reginald, almost Shanky and Veer. So those are the what right, I right. regard as those are the only WWE performance center trained people who are on Raw at the moment. Um, and that's not like a great collection of. I mean, almost is getting pushed. Uh, is Riddick Moss a WWE guy? He's apparently listed on the roster. Yeah, he's a performance center guy too. But like, you know, it's Rick Moss. It's not like anyone big. And then on SmackDown, we got, um, you know, Angelo Dawkins, who we mentioned, Baron Corbin, who we mentioned, um, Commander Aziz, another big guy. Um, yep. I don't know if Dominic, I don't think Dominic is a performance center guy. Um, let's see who else. Montez Ford. Otis is a, is a, a performance center guy. And I think Rick Boogs, is he a performance center guy too? Yeah, he's I'll a performance. Guess Chad, I'll, I'll guess Chad Gable is a performance center guy too then. Uh, Chad was not traded, was not trained by originally a performance center. Obviously, he probably benefited from going to the performance center. So it's kind of a gray area. Right. He's not quite like a Shinsuke Nakamura who clearly like didn't have to go to the performance center. But I believe Chad was trained by, um, I think he's trained, I don't want to say he was trained by the, Brad Reigns or something like that, but I think he was trained by someone up in Minnesota. Um, this is he trained by Eric Cannon. Um, oh, okay. So Mike Quackenbush too. Um, anyway, the point is, is that like you look at the main roster, it's very, it's very light. Like I said, Corbin really is the best case scenario as far as those guys go. And so is that going to improve with with the changes to NXT? I don't know. I don't know. If, you know, maybe some of them will catch on. Someone will in, inevitably hit on a character, perhaps, in NXT that will then get called up to the main roster. But again, that leads to a whole other problem is you can come up to the main roster with a lot of momentum, but Vince is going to drop the ball with you. And 
ultimately why I see is this whole change of NXT is ultimately not going to change that much in WWE unless they cha- it cha- totally changes Vince's mentality to booking, which I don't think is going to happen at this point in time. Yeah, I think the big, biggest change really for NXT is its relevance towards WWE. I think everyone had an idea that NXT was, you know, kind of irrelevant because, you know, it may roster even on commentary. They don't acknowledge NXT that often. Even Charlotte's NXT title yeah. reigns don't count uh, towards her uh, title record as well. And so I think that's where we're slowly starting to see even like um, the takeover media calls. Like I know there's the excuse of the Vegas um, tryout thing, but still like not even like a post game call for a uh, takeover. And so um, I I don't know if that's gonna be the case in the next takeover whether the um, you know triple h will do uh, any media calls but that's definitely an interesting sign for the lack of relevance that nxt will have on wwe yeah and even things like takeover not being in an arena yeah like that really hurt that show like you have you have presumably fifty thousand people or forty five thousand people coming to vegas by the way, in Vegas, there's a million venues that you could probably run an NXT takeover in from varying yeah. sizes. You have all this, these people coming in. I mean, that in, the, in a few years ago, that is a, a sold out, you know, T-Mobile Center or the sold out Thomas and Mack Center um, when it comes to like for the for a takeover show, because you get all the people coming in for SummerSlam that want to see takeover. And this year it was at the Capitol Wrestling Center, like all the other episodes of NXT. And that definitely made it seem like this show is a much less priority and its relevance to the main roster is, is fleeting. And you're right. Like, um, like Karen cross coming up to them, even Karen cross coming up to the main roster and just like losing to Jeff Hardy. Like, it's just like, again, that's something that wouldn't happen. Remember when Kevin Owens came up to the main roster and he had the NXT title belt and was calling out John Cena and said, I don't want your title because this is my prize. I have the NXT title. And it's like that, that feels like a billion years ago compared to what we saw, you know, in recent months. It was a good point about like the, the reigning relevancy and will you get people who, um, you know, eventually I, I know the, the um, you know, the Brian and Vinny show, they basically said, we're not covering NXT anymore. Cause why it's, it's irrelevancy is, is, is lost, you know? Wow. And I think a, a lot of fans will be like, yeah, do I have to watch NXT? You know, if I want to, you know, I've already got Raw and SmackDown. And if you're watching Dynamite, you got that too. And uh, if you've got Rampage, you got that too. Like, there's a lot of competition for people's attention if you're a wrestling fan and if NXT is going to almost devolve into this, you know, uh, you know, just a bunch of green guys bumping into each other and, and guys having, you know, basic five minute matches, it is, it is going to lose relevancy in a lot of fans' eyes. Yeah, I think the only benefit uh, for keeping it watchable is USA Network. Like, I, like obviously, I don't think it's going to be that, it's going to drop that far it's like main event levels uh because obviously main events is uh, peacock only and even i say they have nxt uk like that's peacock only as well uh, and that's another question as well like nxt uk seems totally irrelevant um you know they're just kind of moving guys on to the nxt proper uh but yeah nxt being on usa network at least helps it a little bit you know there's still some sort of prestige being on, on linear cable and so i think that will help it out but yeah that um if it does become more green guys, I think it's just more of uh, following your favorites. You know, if you have a favorite sort of developmental guy you want to follow, that's the only reason you're going to watch, you know, especially if, you know, some of the more top guys either leave the company itself or just move on to the main roster. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely an interest um, in prospects like there isn't any, in every sport, right. There are people who are really into the NFL draft. There are people who are, you know, really into, college basketball, you know, watching, like you said, the G League Ignite team of like the top, you know, draft prospects on in the G League or the, even like the ball is life videos and stuff, you know, that kind of, you know, following high school prep basketball stars. So, and I do think they'll be interested in, for some people, but you're talking real hardcore is when you're talking about people who are like, even know who Parker Bordeaux is, let alone are going to be excited to see him wrestle his first match on television. Um, I just, I don't think that's going to be wide ranging enough to really make it um, like, on USA Network, to me, AW Dark has kind of a similar vibe where they'll bring in some really like interesting, very green, independent talent, um, and they'll get you'll get hardcore fans who are like, oh, I'm excited to see, you know, um, I'm trying to think of a good example of someone like that. Like, uh, is there someone's big? Daniel Garcia. Well, Daniel Garcia, yeah. So Daniel Garcia is like an, like an accomplished indie guy, which I think is different. I'm talking like 
what's her name? It's like Ashley DM Ambrosi or something like that. Yep. Like someone like that who's like got maybe like physical potential and I'm like, oh, I'm excited to see what she's gonna do. But we're talking real hardcore, so we're gonna watch the YouTube show. We're not talking about people who are gonna pop up on, you know, tune in every Tuesday night to watch, you know, Parker Bordeaux or Bronson Rex Steiner, although I will be very interested in watching Bronson Rex Steiner. But I'm obviously not like a, a typical, you know, casual fan uh, of that kind of stuff to even know who that person is. Uh, you have to have a lot of familiarity with WWE's product. So um, I don't know, like, I, I don't know if like people are going to be really into it, especially if like nothing really happens on the show. Like it has to have angles and stuff, but do you want to put those people in angles? And do you want to put these people on national television in general? There's a reason, one of the reasons, like there's a reason like OVW or FCW or whatever weren't really televised outside of the like, you know, small local deals because you don't want to be exposing some of these people on national audience because it's hard if you have like your first ever wrestling match and it's on USA Network and it's bad because it's your first ever wrestling match. Is that the first impression you want people to have on you? Is it like, oh my gosh, this person is very bad. We've seen it um, a lot with like, I feel like in, if you go back to like the Divas era of WWE is that they would put people um, you know, on television who really had no business being wrestlers and even if those they would be very very bad and even if they improved over time they were always fighting against the stigma of being bad professional wrestlers because they were on television every week being bad when they first came up I think the Bella Twins are a good example of people who had really no business being in matches and stuff when they first came to WWE and I think like you know, five or six years into their careers, they got to a more acceptable level, but they were still always going to fight against the, this notion that they were bad pro wrestlers because they had been introduced as such. And I don't think it's an awesome idea to take green people and have their first televised matches be on USA Network. Yeah, 100%. I mean, especially for a two hour show, like even like for OVW, FCW, those were typically like one hour shows. Um, on like their online channels or the local channels and so filling up two hours with people in experience like that's how asking a lot for your audience even your most hardcore audiences like it's asking you a lot to get them invested into that and so um I mean, maybe the production people will probably get you know work overtime to try to make all these video packages and try to you know try to get you excited for that but you're right you know a first impression is everything like you know, a bad first impression can really ruin your career sometimes yeah, especially if you don't have uh, like any kind of background. Like we talk about like people debuting at AEW, like, oh, I hope their, um, you know, their debut goes well because that kind of sets the tone for how they're going to be. And, and you know, Alistair or Malachi Black's debut was great. Look, he's a big star. Andrade's debut, not really great. And he's kind of, I feel like he's kind of struggling a bit. And those are guys with, you know, very long careers of, of, of background coming into it. When you're brand new, I think that first impression is really important and it's going to be tough um, with that. I think that, uh, like you said, a two hour show. And the other thing is like part of this whole notion of NXT is we want to teach these people WWE style, the, the right way, right? There's this idea that they have this right way of teaching everyone. And when the indie guys come in, they muck it up because they know these other things and we don't want them to learn that thing. We have to teach them the WWE way. And we're going to have this very, you know, we have this very form standardized formula for how to teach talent um, and to have like an entire show of just those talents is going to be kind of a challenge because every wrestling show likes to have you know some stylistic variety we want to see talent of different shapes and sizes and different types of matches and if you're everyone is just this you know 250 pound football player having you know the basic wwe five minute match where you know there's a little back and forth and then someone wins on a roll up uh that's going to get old really fast and again i don't just don't know how viable that is as a cable show Yeah, um, you know, I, I don't think people want to watch, you know, guys learning how to do a, he a headlock for a couple minutes uh, for entertaining. That's not exactly entertaining television. And so, um, 
yeah i mean the, the whole idea of like you know i think the whole adage was like get, get the indie out of you mm-hmm. that was the big thing there but you know that they won't be signing indie wrestlers and so um you know the whole we style like even then it's you know it's very questionable of how uh, successful that is but you know that's just a four and out, it's it's more out, an outdated thinking obviously and obviously and that starts with Vince McMahon who still is living you know in the past and that's really where, where it all goes back to it's just at the top with Vince McMahon uh the way he books his company the way he uh, wants wrestling to be in his in his vision yeah and it's also like um and, and Tony Khan had the tweet where he basically said, like, pro wrestling is not, is an art form. It's not, you can't do one specific thing and hope it works for everybody. Everyone has to kind of go their own way, which is clearly a shot at kind of the, the redesign of NXT, which is, here's our system. Here's our formula. It's the best way. It's going to work out. Maybe they know it. They probably know it. it's not going to work out for everybody, but it, it will work out for, is the best way, as opposed to kind of being individual, letting these talents find their own individual way. And it is going to create, like, kind of, it does perhaps create, like, kind of a carbon copy system where all these people are programmed the same and they wrestle the same. And they're going to, they're going to come up in, uh, they're going to come up in wrestling, you know, in Vince, Vince McMahon's vision of pro wrestling, which is like, say sports entertainment, you are a superstar, not a wrestler. Don't say it's a title match. It's a championship opportunity. It's not a title belt. It's a WWE championship and all these various other Vincisms that the, I mean, these are going to be the robots programmed to follow that to a T and maybe that will, um, you know, up, that's probably going to appeal more to Vince than someone who's got other ideas, you know, who's going to have, has a background from outside WWE, but it, it is, uh, it's going to be really weird. It's going to be, I'm, I'm interested in seeing like the first class of kind of these guys who start taking over NXT television, because I, I guess they taped a few weeks of television this week, but after that, it's going to be like, well, they're almost like re, they're going to reboot it. So like in a month from now, we're going to see, I think like a, a rebooted NXT, the color scheme might be different. The logo might be different. I wonder, you know, how much talent is still going to be around. I wouldn't surprise me if a lot of NXT regular talent is, is released soon. You know, we've already seen some cuts being made, but I wonder, you know, if they're just going to introduce like 10 new guys, like this is so-and-so, this is so-and-so here, here, they're going to have a match. And it's going to, because eventually it does, it does sound like that, that is what they're planning on doing. Yeah. I think the number from the Vegas tryouts was 13 to 18, somewhere around there, but I'm sure they probably have their own, uh, um, you know, favorite prospects, perhaps they're getting them, they're trying to get them television ready in like three, around three weeks or so, or even, you know, maybe a a whole month and a half that they've been trying to get them ready. But yeah, that that seems to be the case where, you know, I think the whole angle of them trashing the Capitol Wrestling Center, that's a whole, just the whole thing for a whole redesign of it. But still, um, I think it's what you mentioned earlier, like, NXT before it could really sell it could really sell really good live events in, in terms of different arenas and I think that's another big thing for NXT as well like there's just the whole sameness uh with the Capital Wrestling Center like they need to at least move around Florida at least you know you don't need to go touring uh, across the country but at least move around to different places in Florida and just you know get away from the whole performance center that they're in uh for all the time but I if the WWE is going to be develop, developmental I don't know if they're actually going to be traveling around you know different parts of in the state well what's interesting to me about the capital wrestling center especially with what they're doing now with like in regards to how they get fans in that building which they have a very loyal subset of fans who attend almost every taping and they you know they're showing up at full sale they're getting bussed over they're waiting for for everything to to, to, to see these shows live and those people are big big fans of the way nxt used to be and the way nxt currently is um, and we've seen it with like talent like Johnny Gargano and Adam Cole getting cheered, um, even though that they're heels, supposed to be heels because they're their favorites, right? And I think it's a challenge. Now, if that is the fan base that you're relying on to get into this new product, I think that is going to be a big mistake because I think a lot of these fans, I mean, we've seen these are the fans who rejected Lars Sullivan. They didn't like, they don't even like, they don't like Cross. They don't like, they don't like Corbin. They didn't like, they don't like the WWE body guys, right? The Vince guys. So you're going to get rid of, you know, all of their favorites and replace them with the Parker Bordeaux types. I don't think they're going to be 
that invested in it. I'm sure you can find other fans who will get into it um, at least, but I do think it's going to be a, t- a different, you're totally going to talk about different, like kind of like fan elements base. I don't think you're going to get the really enthusiastic, you know, very indie knowledgeable crowd that has kind of been the staple of NXT since it started airing television. And it's, it's going to be something different. You might go to like more of a studio segment. They might go to the Thunderdome. Like they might have the television screens might come back. I don't know if they're going to tour because it does seem like they're punting on the idea of NXT being interesting. It's NXT. NXT can be either developmental or it can be like a super indie where people are interested in it. And they definitely want it to be more of a developmental. And I do think that they're kind of be like, look, we don't care if we're going to be showing all these green guys. Um, this is our new, this is developmental. They're supposed to be green. They're supposed to make mistakes, which is good. You know, it's good to have that. It's, a, it's probably a better atmosphere for the talent. But at the same time, I don't know, like fans are going to care at all. Yeah, I mean, there's very little evidence of uh, like a, a subs uh, like a, of an audience that wants developmental wrestling. There isn't really um, any sort of track record of you know any type of hidden fan base that you're trying to reach. You know, obviously with AEW, like they there was a fan base of people who didn't like WWE or just want something different in wrestling. So that obviously they understood that they, oh there is this um hit, like hidden fan base. You know, quote unquote. Uh, that's are amazing uh but there isn't really uh any sort of fan base at least there isn't a track record of one that is you know uh, eager for developmental wrestling and so that's really asking a lot if they do drive away these hardcore nxt fans yeah i mean nxt itself got popular because there was clearly an interest within wwe's own fan base of a more serious more athletic based wrestling product um that's what there was enough interest to turn NXT into a viable entity as opposed to it just being, um, you know, the reality show that it was when it first started or FCW where it's like developmental. It was, there was an interest in that. And I don't, like I said, I don't, yeah, I don't know where that example is. I don't want to go too overboard because we still haven't seen the changes of NXT yet. We're still interested in seeing the transition phase. We don't know if it really is just going to be all of these people rolling, you know, rolling out and having boring five minute matches because um, you know, Samoa Joe just won the NXT title and Samoa Joe is kind of the antithesis of every, which is weird because it seems Samoa Joe is like the opposite of what they want NXT to be now, right? Yeah. He's old. <laughs> he doesn't have a good body. He has all of this wrestling knowledge and background from other companies. He doesn't work like the other people in WWE. Like he's the kind of opposite yet. He just won the title. Um, I wonder what's going to happen. Are they going to uh, bring up new people and have them feud with Samoa Joe? How many of the old veteran standbys are still going to be around? Because it does, like, regardless of what you're doing, it makes sense to have, like, a Roderick Strong there to work with some of these green guys because Roderick Strong's great and you want the great talent to be able to teach, you know, the, these green talent that might have athletic potential but don't have a ton of in-ring experience. And so I, I, it might not just be this whole just entirely different thing. It might, it might be a little bit slower than we think, but I, you know, I still think that they're going to be, you know, hurting themselves if they're, they, they're going to hurt the, the current popularity of NXT. And I'm interested in seeing like what the, the, the USA ratings end up being because they're competitive right now. They're not great, but they're competitive. You know, what if they go down? What if they, you know, are falling out of the top 50 of cable, like they, they already have in the past. What if they are doing like a, you know, a 0.05, you're doing half in the demo, what they're doing now, um, you know, does USA pull the plug and does, 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 um, does WWE care? You know, they're looking at this as a long-term investment of like, we're getting talent ready for the next generation. And, you know, maybe we won't have this cool little indie that makes us a little bit of money on the side, but it's going to pay off in the long run when we have the next Rock and Steve Austin. Yeah, I mean, for the Samoa Joe point, I mean, there is a bit of a slight bit of precedent uh, for that. I um, mean, Adam McCole, I remember he took on Carmelo Hayes, you know, just randomly in a singles match. You know, um, obviously Leon Ruff, he got his big push right away against Johnny Gargano and that Davian Priest feud. And those guys were pretty new to WOE. And so I guess there is some slight precedent of like a newer guy coming in and facing a veteran up top but like you said how viable that is and how entertaining or a product that can actually be is another story 
for that. But maybe that is the plan uh, there for have Samoa Joe to go up against the young guys, you know, try to make them look good and try to build that good first impression with a more experienced veteran like a Samoa Joe. But yeah, I mean, what, that's going to be a big thing I'm going to be looking at is the USA Network's reaction to this. Um, because obviously we've seen uh, with Fox and um, USA in terms of the raw section, you know, obviously there's a bit of conflict there of like, oh, who's, who's getting who, um, you know, which, uh, how is our product looking, uh, who is getting the promotions and all that there. But if USA doesn't really care what's happening with NXT, that's kind of more telling of how valuable they see that brand. Yeah, well, you know, I'm, you know, Brandon Thurston, who we had on last, uh, last time, has you know pretty much reported that you know NXT they're getting some money from USA but it's really not that much um and so like it's not of a super high priority you know it doesn't seem like a super high pro- priority for WWE at the moment and it doesn't seem like a super high priority to uh you know NBC Universal as opposed to Raw who we know that they're you know paying a billion dollars over the the, the five-year span that obviously have much more invested in it and much more concerned about what's happening, what are our ratings each week, what are we doing in the key demo, what are, you know, what stars are we going to have, what's, what plans are we going to have to get people interested in the show. I think with USA, I think that, you know, that, that same kind of interest doesn't necessarily exist at the same level for NXT, and I do think if, w, I mean, they probably, they, WWE probably wants to keep NBC happy for obvious reasons, but at the same time, they're like, look, you know, we're not, and making a ton of money off this NXT deal. We see this as a long-term investment. So we are going to take a step back to take multiple steps forward, which is, yeah, you know what? NXT might not be a big hit on, on Tuesday nights anymore, okay? But, you know, again, when we get the next Steve Austin and the next Rock, because our, our you know, we're, we're, we've got this brilliant philosophy that's going to take all these great big athletes and turn them into, you know, gigantic stars, uh, you'll be, you know, it, it'll all be a, a moot point because, you know, it was such, it will be such a big success, but it's a gamble because as we've said, we, I, we, I personally don't think it's going to change anything. You know, I don't think they're going to create the next Steve Austin and the rock just because they're changing NXT. I think it's going to have to come from a lot more of stuff happening involving, you know, the head of creative and Vince McMahon to do that. Yeah. I think um, that idea in and of itself, you know, just pulling the plug on a product that was once hot, but it's kind of sort of faded. It's just sort of starting back from square one and then hoping that in, lo- in the long term, you do have fine success. I think in a vacuum that works, but for WWE, obviously, yeah, like so it's like sort of what uh, we've been saying that in a WWE system, that's not going to work because you still have Vince McMahon running things. And so that's probably why this, um, this investment is probably like uh, whether it actually reaches the long, long, the long term uh, goal is probably unlikely, but in a vacuum, I think I, I can understand sort of like the ideas behind it of why um, they, they would want to pursue this. But yeah, in the WWE system, it's probably not going to work. Yeah, and it will be interesting to see. I mean, it's going to have, if they, have, you know, if WWE has the edict on, we're not signing any more indie guys, we're going to be doing these camps. And you know, look, they blew up the camp, you know, this week, you know, last week where they invited the media and they said, look at all our, our WWE trial camps. And everyone's like, this is the sign of a new NXT. They have those trial camps all of the time. If you read the Observer, they, yep. you know, for years and years, Dave has that usually has the names and the athletic backgrounds of everyone they have. They'll have, oh, they had a trial camp today in Florida, you know, here are the names and there'll be like 20 guys and they'll be, you know, like, you know, Deshaun Taylor, you know, he was offensive tackle at Wake Forest University and he was a tryout and, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, you know, Mandy, uh, you know, Babineau was, was here and she was a track and field athlete at, you know, University of Tennessee, like they get all, they, they that, that they've been doing that for years and years. So I don't see like the, the, the thing in the past week as like a big game changer. Oh, they offer contracts to these guys. Like they offer contracts to those people all the time. They, that's why they have a warehouse full of hundred, like uh, over a hundred talents, um, you know, of WB performance center people. So I don't see that as like a necessarily a big change, but if they are doing where we're not signing indie guys anymore, it's going to make a big difference in the entire wrestling industry because a lot of this indie talent that was getting snapped up by WWE will be looking for other places to go. And you'll see people, um, you know, AEW obviously will be interested in them, but AEW has a limit in how many indie people that they can sign, even though they, uh, you know, are very still aggressive in, in bringing in anyone who gets a little bit of buzz. 
Um, but maybe if AEW is like, oh, WWE is not going to sign people as soon as they sign them. Maybe we don't have to, you know, jump and grab everybody. Maybe we let this talent develop on the indies. And, you know, AEW's contract system is different where, you know, they let guys work indies, um, which helps. But I do think you're going to see it's good if you're, you know, an indie promoter. It's good if you're beyond wrestling. It's good if you're PWG. It's good if you're, you know, uh, AAW. It's good if you're GCW, you know, right? You're going to have probably more time with all of this talent because WWE is not immediately signing them. And it's going to change, you know, impact and ring of honor will be probably become more viable options if the, the indie talent can't go to WWE. And um, it's going to have a big impact, I think, on the overall, you know, feeding system of WWE, of the re- of pro wrestling, because you're going to have, uh, if WWE is kind of off of the table and they're, you know, pulling back, uh, you know, into their own little world and they're not going to no longer be pursuing all this talent. All that talent is going to be, have, you know, more options to go. And that, that should be really interesting. I'm actually excited about it because it sucks seeing talent get signed and then not seeing them for a year. Right. Cause that happened a lot. Like I remember when Dijak got signed, like he was gaining momentum on ring of honor. He was working PWG. It was like, Oh yeah, this is one, you know, one of my, you know, intro, most favorite, my favorite indie wrestlers. And then he got signed by WWE and then he wasn't on television for like 18 months. And it was just because he, you know, they didn't have anything for him to do and it took him a really long time. And it was just like 18 months of his prime, just gone. And so I'm, I'll be happy if that kind of process is kind of taken out of, of the wrestling world. And instead we have talent actually getting, you know, working around and finding, you know, the best places for them to go. Yeah, I think it's very uh very good for the, the ring of honors and the impacts you know you're you're no longer in the bidding war for talents you know i, I think that we haven't really seen um this manifest with aw sort of bidding in a bidding war of ring of honor or impacts you know since like you know at least they're you know aw is working with impacts but yeah we haven't really seen that bidding war between those companies but usually yeah like if ring of honor is interested in talents WWE could always just offer more money to that talent. And, you know, if they're financially motivated, you know, like you, why not take more than more, more money? You know, you don't really blame them for that. But yeah, Ring of Honor, they're able to make more um, financially, um, you know, responsible decisions. You know, they don't have to splurge money on random talents, you know, in, in terms of investments. You know, they can just, you know, actually wait for these talents to develop and then they can sign them and then, you know, just work with them as well. And that could really help out, you know, their momentum uh, as, you know, they're slowly starting to build uh, some there with, you know, all their talents they have now. But, you know, if they can sign younger talents, you know, that can really help out their system and, you know, grow bigger and try to, you know, at least regain uh, some, I guess, uh, prestige. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're you're licking your chops if you're, you know, if you're Billy Corgan in the NWA, if you're Impact, if you're ROH, if you're any indie promoter, um, you know, who, who's got a lot of ambition, you're licking, licking your chops thinking about, I'm, you know, I'm going to get more, more time with the talent that I find. Because that was a big thing with like Beyond. Like I remember I've talked to Drew Cordero of Beyond before about this issue. And it's like, yeah, look, we have to think that if someone gets over on one of our shows, we're going to only have them for a few months because then they're going to get signed by WWE. And now, you know, they might get signed by AEW. And they might get signed by another company. And now you're thinking, oh, WWE is off the board. Maybe that I'll have the talent for a year and I can build storylines around that talent as opposed to just being like, you know, kind of rushing through everything. Um and yeah, if you're a Ring of Honor, you're 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 happy. I mean, is it good? For, it might not be good for the talent financially because once you you take a, a big player um, that everyone is afraid of in a bidding war out of out of the uh, out of the the scheme, but you still have AEW who will you know if you're really talented, AEW is going to make a competitive offer. And you know, a lot of people are you know want to spend money on pro wrestling, like the the you know for for all the talk about pro wrestling being dead. If you look outside of WWE. Billy Corgan wants to spend money on pro wrestling. Maybe doesn't have a lot of money to spend on pro wrestling, but they they want to spend. Um, Impact, look, those people, you know, the 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 um, Anthem who owns Impact, they bought a TV station, Access TV, basically do just have Impact on television. They're they're clearly looking to spend money. Uh, uh, Sinclair, who owns Ring of Honor, look, it, it's amazing when you think about it because you think of Sinclair's reputation, but they handled the pandemic better than any other promotion. Um, you know, it cost them probably from popularity standpoint, but, you know, Ring of Honor, they, they paid all their talents. 
They, they were super, super, super safe when it came to taping. They took them a long time to come back, but when they did, they created a bubble environment and they did empty arena shows and they treated their talent really well during the pandemic by all accounts. And they're, again, you, they did that because they're willing to spend money on Ring of Honor. They're you're signing guys to big, bigger contracts. So, and obviously AEW obviously is clearly willing to spend money. So there are, they, you know, there, there are companies out there willing to spend money on talent, which is great. And, um, Obviously, we talk about indie talent that, you know, instead of going to WWE, we'll have more time on the indies. But also, you know, when they do re totally relaunch NXT, and we've already seen some of it already happen, more talent getting released, that talent's got to find a way to, place to go. And I think the wrestling industry in general is going to be benefit beneficial to us. There's a rumor that Buddy Murphy and Braun Strowman and Bray Wyatt perhaps might be on their way to impact. That's great. That's great for all parties involved. It will definitely help impact a lot, getting that kind of talent invested in that, that kind of name value. And it gives those talent an outlet to continue their careers in pro wrestling and you know be on television, at least have some relevancy. So there's a lot of benefits to this, um, despite the fact that I think both of us are kind of lukewarm on the actual changes of NXT really being that significant as far as you know, helping the professional wrestling industry. Yeah, it's just going to have like, many other like sort of outside effects, probably more so than internal effects for WWE. Like for me, for WWE, it's just more, just more of the same, you know, just going back, back to basics, back to the past. But yeah, for, whole, for wrestling as a whole, it's going to, um, at least it potentially could uh, be a big benefit. And hey, even, you know, these companies are spending money, you know, fans will spend money as well if you're popular enough, you know, if, you know, you can build a loyal fan base that will pay for whatever shirts or whatever merch uh, that you, you put out online, you know, obviously there's many other outlets like, you know, uh, Cameo and all the other stuff that fans will spend money on if you're popular enough and builds, you know, a, a loyal enough fan base. And so, yeah, there's lots of uh, revenue streams out there. Uh, obviously not as good as WWE's, but still, like you said, um, it, 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 so some of those things can't halt, halt your career, like a, a, like a die jack, you know, when you, if you're not, if you're on TV, if you're not on TV for like 18 or 12, 16 months, you know, that can really hurt your career. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, so that's pretty much all I have to say currently on NXT. You got anything else you want to add? Something that we didn't cover? Um, just, just mostly just the end, a closing thought of just like, I don't really consider this a doom and gloom kind of thing that most people see for NXT. Um, you know, obviously NXT had a peak points, but at the same time, these past, like this whole past year for NXT, I, I've personally kind of lost interest in it. Uh, uh, just cause like, yeah, there's not, it just, just more WWE fight, I guess, you know, more main roster stuff going into NXT and that's just something I'm not interested in for the NXT product and so maybe um it could be a benefit to go back to a developmental system like a, hi a hybrid system more so than just um uh, in between of an indie uh a brand or just a made roster brand yeah I agree I mean there's it's clear that NXT wasn't as hot you know for a lot of fans um, now than it was a few years ago I think you know going to USA going to two hours talent just sticking around for a long time when previously they had, you know, always been moved out and new talent coming in. Uh, yeah. So, you know, it, it definitely it, it is NXT. Like people were talking about NXT takeover 36, like it's the end of an era and, and maybe it is, but it's also kind of like, you know what, this is the arrow is kind of on its last likes anyway. And maybe going back to square one um, and kind of rebranding everything, you know, it's a bold step and it, it might be end up being really necessary. Uh, and, you know, I'm pessimistic on talent being able to develop in WWE and, you know, the next Rock and Steve Austin to be created under Vince McMahon's watch. But we'll see, you know, maybe maybe it won't. Maybe something will happen. Maybe someone will really turn heads uh, on NXT television that maybe wouldn't have gotten that shot previously. And that could be all, the only all WWE needs to, to kind of, you know, get back on track and start, you know, creating new fans again. Um, so I want to thank everyone for listening and tuning in. Obviously, uh, we had a lot of support over the last few weeks um, coming off our WrestleNomics episode with Brandon Thurston talking about Nick Khan. You can find that on our YouTube page. Um, might be up next for all I know in the, the algorithm. But um, obviously, keep everyone stay calm. Uh, big wrestling weekend coming up over the next uh, few weeks. We've got All Out coming up. We've got so much happening. I mean, we this easily could have been a CM Punk episode, but thinking about maybe waiting until after All Out. Uh, I want to see the all-up pay-per-view number, really, before we start talking about CM Punk. Um, 
bunch of more stuff coming up, obviously. NXT, who knows what we're going to see in the next month. You know, Brock Lesnar back in WWE. Um, G1 is coming up. We have no idea who's going to be the G1 field, but it's, start, it's starting uh, next month. Million stuff happening. Uh, appreciate all the support. And we will be back in two weeks again, and we will see everyone then. Thanks so much.